Buddhaya. Good evening. Welcome to the Buddha Dharma TV. I am Karen Tan. Today we begin our program with a Buddhist hymn called Paticca Samupada by Visarada Savima Ratnayaka of Sri Lanka. Paticca Samupada. Avijja Pachaya Sankara Sankara Pachaya Yeah. 
And now we are coming to the end of the Book of Fives. And so usually when we come to a sutta in the, any of the chapters in the Anguttara Nikaya, I sort of look through the sutta in advance. I find maybe parallel texts or texts that will shed a different light on the sutta, and I put them together. I make some notes. And then I use that as the basis for the class. But today we're going to be doing, as we come to the last sections of the Book of Fives, this will be something like, we have the expression of potluck. Potluck is where people bring different dishes to having like a party and everybody prepares their own dish. Is that what it is? This is a little bit like potluck or maybe a better expression. Is it something grab bag where you have a bag with different like presents in it and everybody reaches in and the presents are wrapped up in different kinds of wrapping paper so you don't know what you're getting but you just put your hand in and you pick out something in the bag and then you open it up and maybe with the kids ah it's a little model car ah it's a little doll ah it's a a, a rubber softball so they get the different presents within the big bag. So we're just going to go through. I just did a very quick look this morning just to see what's here. But we're not going to do elaborate explanations of each one, but just see some of the suttas maybe will be a little bit strange. Okay, so... Okay, so now, so you see, this is the fifth 50, so it's really is the last major section in the Book of Fives. And so now, Sutta number 201. Yeah, this is quite a very important Sutta, actually. So here, a monk by the name of Kimbila comes to the Buddha and asks, what is the cause and reason why the good Dhamma doesn't continue long after the Tathagata or a Buddha attains final Nibbana. And from the actual wording of the Pali, it's a little bit ambiguous whether the question concerns the teaching of any Buddha, including like the Buddhas of the distant past and maybe Buddhas of the future, according to the hypothesis there are <laughs> Buddhas through the three periods of time, or whether it's referring specifically to the teaching of our Buddha, the Buddha Gautama, or Shakyamuni. And I translated it as if it were a generalization, but another monk who I consulted when doing this translation, Venerable Brahmali in Australia, he disagreed and he thought that he said, it seems more likely to me that the sutta is concerned specifically what will happen after Gautama Buddha passes away. 
So from the actual wording of the Pali, we just can't determine exactly what is the intention, whether it's a generalization or something referring specifically to the Buddha Gotama. But it seems to me it's a generalization. Okay, so now the Buddha is answering, and he says that after a, the Buddha has attained final Ibana, the bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, male lay followers, and female followers dwell without reverence and deference towards the teacher. The word translated teacher here is, I have to use a capital T to show it's referring to the Buddha himself. It's the satta. It's not a teacher, but it is the satta. So the satta is the one who establishes the teaching in the world, not just somebody who continues to teach. Okay, so they dwell without reverence and deference towards the teacher, the Buddha, without reverence and deference towards the Dhamma, without reverence and deference towards the Sangha, without reverence and deference towards the training. So these are four essential objects of reverence the triple gem, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. And then you could like divide the Dhamma into two aspects. The aspect of, maybe you could say, doctrine and practice. So when you make that division, then the doctrine, is, Dhamma is the doctrine, and the practice is the training. And then the fifth one is very important and interesting. We often tend to overlook this. They dwell without reverence and deference toward each other. In other words, the Buddha is extremely deeply concerned in order to ensure that his teaching will last long, that there will be harmony within the community that he established, that he, that he's established. And that community has four divisions. So we could say that this is the division within the Sangha. Oh, I see. Okay, it's up here. It's the bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, the male lay followers and female followers. So to ensure that the teaching lasts long, these four communities have to have reverence and deference towards each other. And maybe we could see this as operating both internally, let's say in terms of internal relations and external relations. Internal relations mean within the community of monks, they have to have reverence and deference towards each other. Within the community of bhikkhunis or nuns, reverence and deference towards each other. And so too with male lay followers and female lay followers. So that is like having harmony within the country, so that the country doesn't get split apart into a kind of maybe a nonviolent civil war, internal conflicts, divisions, hostility, or like international, like wars between countries. That would be the conflicts between these different communities. Okay, so we have to have this internal harmony within each community and sort of an external harmony between the four communities, the four subdivisions of the greater Buddhist community. So when you have, when that harmony breaks up because of lack of reverence and deference, then the teaching will gradually wither away and vanish.
Are you still hearing me? I just got some strange message that I'm signed out. Yes, Bhante. Okay, that must refer to my other computer. Okay, so the opposite of this, why does the good Dhamma continue long after the Buddha has attained Parinibbana? And of course, the answer follows just logically from the above. So it's when the monks, nuns, lay male and female lay followers have reverence and deference towards the, towards the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, and the training, and they dwell with reverence and deference towards each other. But within, I have to say, within this reverence and deference, you know, we're in a democratic uh, social order now, but in the Buddhist community, traditionally, there's reverence and deference of the lay people towards the monastics, because the monastics give up the household life and live a life of renunciation and devote themselves fully, or at least in theory, fully to the study, practice, and teaching of the Dhamma. But still there should be, let's say, respect amongst members of all four communities towards each other. We'll take a few suttas, then we could take some questions. But if you have your questions on, on your own, if you have some paper next to you, you could write them or you could type them, and then we'll get to them later. OK, this is just a short one. I use this as the basis for a talk during the Labor Day retreat. So five benefits in listening to the Dhamma. And we have to remember in the Buddha's time, there were no printed books, no Dhamma books, not even, not to speak of printed books, there were not even palm leaf manuscripts, written manuscripts that recorded the, the Buddha's teaching. But to learn the Dhamma, you have to go to listen to talks on the Dhamma or to get personal teaching from a teacher. So five benefits in listening to the Dhamma. You get to hear what you haven't heard before. You can clear up. You get like elaborations on teachings that you might have heard. Brief teachings might be expounded in more detail. Unclear teachings might have been explained more clearly. You get over your doubts and perplexity. You have a chance by listening to the Dhamma, you can straighten out your views that you clarify and um, maybe you get your understanding becomes sharper and clearer more precise and sometimes they say just by listening to the dhamma the mind becomes tranquil calm collected okay so five benefits in listening to the dhamma we have some teachings that are we've gone through already. I'll skip over those. Yeah, this is a very important one. This is on the word is translated here as barrenness. The Pali word is kila. Kila. Yeah, I think I have it in the note. Well, Chaito kila. And so it's here rendered mental barrenness. Venerable Jnana Moli, in his translation of the Majjhimanikaya, had translated it as wilderness of the heart. But in a way, that's not quite satisfactory because wilderness suggests like a forest in which there are many trees growing, there are many bushes, plants, moss, ferns, a lot of wildlife. But Kela, the, the Pali word kila has almost the opposite meaning. The actual sense is that of barren land. Like you have like a piece of, maybe it used to be fertile farmland, but now because of, you see sometimes pictures of the impact of climate change when there's, no, when there's long drought, 
no rain, then the land that had once been fertile farmland becomes hard soil, crack, cracks appear and nothing will grow. So that's kila, it's barren land, hard, arid soil. And then in relation to the mind, it's barrenness of mind, rigidity of mind. Okay, so what are these five kinds of mental barrenness? And it's explained with regard to the monk, but it could apply to anybody. So one is perplexed about the teacher, again the Buddha, this is doubt about the Buddha. And then the consequence, when you have doubt, perplexity, uncertainty about the Buddha, then you don't put, place confidence in him. And so the mind doesn't incline to effort, to striving, to diligent practice. And so the mind becomes barren, like a plot of land on which the crops won't grow. Then you have this perplexity and doubt about the Dhamma. Of course, a kind of inquisitive doubt is what the Buddha encourages, but this is more like a kind of stubborn, skeptical doubt, a kind of paralyzing state of uncertainty. And so one is not able to place trust in the Dhamma, and then you don't make the effort to practice diligently. <laughs> You have doubt about the Sangha, and in this case, it's the Aryan Sangha. Like many people, so I have to say, sadly, when they observe the behavior sometimes of contemporary monks, it's more monks than nuns. <laughs> Usually the nuns inspire more confidence than some of the monks. <laughs> it leads to perplexity and doubt. But this is not referring to the conventional monastic order, but it's the Aryan Sangha the spiritual community of noble ones. And again, there's no effort, striving, diligent practice. Similarly, if you have doubt about the training, then you're not going to devote yourself to the training. But then the fifth one is interesting here, because this ties up with the five things that lead that shorten the lifespan of the Buddha's teaching. Yeah, I'm getting some. I, you have to ask people to keep muted. So remember, the fifth thing that leads to the decline of the Dhamma is that the community, members of the community, dwell without reverence and deference towards each other. And so we have a sort of counterpart to that here. And here the Buddha is just narrowly focusing on the monks. <laughs> Maybe it's because conflicts tend to erupt between the monks more often than between the other communities. <laughs> but I think it happens in all the communities that here we have a monk is irritated by his fellow monks, displeased with them, and resentful towards them, ill-disposed towards them. And when that happens, then he doesn't incline to effort and striving. And so that becomes a kind of mental barrenness. Yeah, so you could see that very close similarity between the five kinds of mental barrenness and the five things that lead to the decline of the Dhamma after the Buddha passes away. And then corresponding to the five kinds of mental barrenness, there's another group called the five kinds of bondage, bondages of the mind. Yes, yeah, so these are called Chaitaso Vini Bandha. And then the commentary says that these are things that grasp the mind, that shackle it as though you're grabbing it with a fist. And so therefore they're called bondages of the mind. So the first three, and again is explained with relation in regard to a monk. And the first three seem a bit similar. 
So the monk is sort of overcome by lust for sensual pleasures, desire, passion, craving for them. And when that happens, then the mind doesn't incline to effort and striving. Then there's lust for the body. I guess that was means attachment to one's own body. Then lust for form. You know, I don't really know so much what is really the distinction between form, because form could have two meanings, rupa. One meaning is visible forms. And so in a way you would think that that is comprised under lust for sensual pleasures. And then the other meaning of form is material form, that is one's own body. You would think that would be included under lust for the body. You know, maybe in setting out this group, the Buddha wanted to have five bondages of the mind corresponding to the five kinds of mental barrenness. So to create a group of five, he just brings in form here. Okay, then the fourth one, is that the monk eats as much as he wants until his belly is full. And then once he gets a full belly, then when it comes time for meditation, he starts thinking, I ate too much, I really have to lie down. Maybe take a little rest before I can start practicing meditation. And then he'll set his alarm clock for two hours, so he'll take a little nap of two hours. (laughs) And so then he indulges in the, what's called the pleasure of rest. Of course, rest is neutral, rest you need, but this is the pleasure of sloth, the pleasure of sleep. And so then after taking a, a nap for two hours, he wakes up and the mind is sort of reeling from excess of sleep. And then he just doesn't have that determination to undertake the work of practice. So that's the fourth bondage of the mind. Then the fifth one is that the monk lives the spiritual life, the life of renunciation and even the life of meditation but not aiming for liberation, but hoping for rebirth in a certain group of devas. With the thought, by following this code of virtuous behavior, undertaking these observances, even practicing austerity, renunciation, I will be reborn as a deva, or as a follower of the devas amongst the group of devas. So actually, it seems in this case, he actually is undertaking effort, perseverance, and striving, but the striving is not directed towards gaining insight, wisdom, and liberation, but maybe doing meritorious practices in order to get reborn in the deva world. So those are the five bondages of the mind. Okay, any questions at this point about any of these things we've covered? Okay, I don't see any ha- Okay, I see one, so this will be Charu Dhamma. Uh, yes, Bhante. Uh, what is uh, the meaning of deference, the Pali for deference in the first discourse? Um, and, and the implications of the lack of deference, which I think we see these days. Yeah. You know, I shouldn't know it offhand. <laughs> Let me just, I'm opening up the Okay, good. Okay, so what was the number of that sutta? 2,201? Yeah. 
the, uh, the Pali word, I'll copy and put it in. Okay, do, do you see it now? It's sapatisa, and it seems to me that it's composed from a prefix sa means with, and patisa. I wonder if it's glossed any place. Let's just see. Okay, I think I see the sense now. So it's a certain, maybe I, we would call it respect for seniority based on the commentary. So the comment, this is a commentary, I think this was the Vinaya commentary, that closes Sagarava as Garubhava. So Garubhava is treating as weighty in the sense weighty, in the sense of showing respect. So Garava, you can see it's with, and then ga, the word Garava is actually related to the word Garu. And Garu is the Pali for counterpart of the Sanskrit Guru. And the original meaning of Guru is when you take somebody as a Guru, as a teacher, but now they have political Gurus and cultural Gurus. But the original meaning of guru in the spiritual context is heavy. So the person who is treated as heavy in the sense that you assign importance to that person, that that person has a major role in one's life, that is one's guru. And so it's the person towards whom one shows reverence. So that's the guru, guru bhava. And that's garava is derived from the word guru. And then sapatis, sapatisa is related to the word jataka bhava. Jataka means elder. So it's the one who is treated as being an elder. Like a jataka bhata is the elder brother. So it's a relationship of respect that juniors will show towards elders, or maybe that those of, say, less spiritual development will sh extend to those who are at higher levels of spiritual development. Yeah, I think I take that to be the sense of sapatisa. Okay, let's see. Thank you, Bandit. Okay, now I've lost sight of it. Oh, here it is, okay. Okay, when you finish, then you lower the hand. Next is Damon. Yes, thank you, Bhante. Uh, could you reconcile the um, admonishment against doubt with the Buddha's invite for us to not take his word for things, but to find out for ourselves? Yeah, I, I think I, I just made that distinction. I said that, that the Buddha encourages what I call inquisitive doubt, interrogation, okay. investigative doubt, but this is a kind of stubborn um, right. kind of state of perpetual perplexity, indecision, unwillingness to sort of take that step of, it's a little bit like, yeah, there's a simile that occurs, I think it's in the questions of King Melinda, that faith is like when you come to a river and you're on one side and 
you want to get across the river, you have to jump into the water and start to swim. If you are always standing on the bank and just doubting, can I cross the river? Can I cross the river? Should I cross the river? Then you just don't get across the river. We all want to be good. We all also want to help the helpless. But unfortunately, we don't know how to do it. And why do we need to do it, etc. Here is Vulnerable Ajahan Brahm to talk about it. Let's listen to what the Vulnerable Master has to say regarding this. There's only a few questions here this evening. But I'm sure that during the the talk and that many more questions may come up. So if you need to ask some more questions, please feel free to do so. A lot of time to encourage questions. I've often told a story, which I think many of you may remember, that one day somebody came to see the Buddha and they asked, 
their own questions. And the question they said, first of all, well, I work very, very hard and I don't spend much money, but nevertheless, even though I work hard, it's very difficult to get enough spare money to retire or go on holidays. Why is it that even I worked hard at school and I work hard now, I still can't you know, make enough money to retire? And other people, they don't work hard at all. And they make lots of money. Why don't I become rich in this life? And the Buddha replied to him, there's a reason for that from your past life. And I think the reason usually is, if you were generous in a past life, you usually have like more money spare in this life. It's because of generosity. He was so pleased with that, que that answer, he asked another question. He said, why is it that some people are beautiful? Even when they were born, they don't do much for themselves, but they find it so easy to find a partner because they're very attractive. While other people are just ugly, even if they go to spas or they go to South Korea, to Gangnam to have reconstruction, they still don't look nice. Why is it that some people are beautiful while other people are ugly? And you may have noticed that when I said this um, story, I was looking at the floor. Yeah. And there's a reason behind that, because once, once I was in, it was in Singapore when I told this story, and I just happened, just happened by chance to be looking at one woman when I said ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and she really complained. <laughs> Why did you say ugly when you were looking at me, Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> and so it's also not so much of a difficulty now because I'm an old monk. If you say like, beautiful when you happen to be looking at somebody, again people feel, oh, what is this monk about? <laughs> so I usually look at the floor. But he gave a good answer. And you know the, the reason for beautiful or ugly in this life it's usually because of your virtuous behavior in the past, if you're a good person. But anyhow, he was pleased with that answer. But the reason I tell this story was the last question this man asked, why is it that some people are intelligent? They manage to pass exams at school and university. They don't tend to do much work. But they still, they pass and get first class honours and they ha they're just so intelligent people. Well, you may have some children, you get them, you know, tutors, extra special help with their O levels or A levels and still they fail. Why is it that some people are naturally intelligent while other people are stupid? Why? And the Buddha gave the answer, which is a beautiful answer. That you will be intelligent in your next life. You find it easy going through school and university. You don't have to do much work and you still get top grades. You'll be intelligent in your next life if you ask questions in this <laughs> life. If you don't ask questions, or oh, you'll have a very difficult time in your next life. So, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go for the first one. And you know, that makes a lot of sense to me. Simply because that idea of questioning, interest in finding out the answers to things, in a respectful way, is very important. And at least in Buddhism, the type of Buddhism we teach here, you're always allowed to ask questions. Now to challenge monks and nuns, what are you doing? What do you do that for? And it is our job to do the very best to answer those questions, out of respect for the Dhamma. So you get asked a lot of questions. Thank you for doing that. And for a long time, I always try to do my best to answer them to the best of my ability. Sometimes I fail because maybe the time's running out or it's late at night, but I will always try and respect your question to give the best answer I possibly can. 
That's how I've been taught. The Buddha said the two things you're supposed to do is Dhamma Sawanang, which is listening to Dhamma, and Dhamma Sakacha, which is asking questions. Both are just as important, and it's important that we do this and we respect the words of the Buddha. Anyway, first question. During the first stage of meditation, i.e. establishing present moment awareness by letting go of past and future, can there still be skillful in a commentary to direct the mind away from past and future? This is, for those of you who are not on the retreat, I was telling that even in Anapanasati Sutta taught by the Buddha, the Buddha said the first thing to do is to find a convenient location, a place which is not disturbed by lots of sound. And he even said, like a place which hasn't got too many mosquitoes or creeping crawling things to disturb you. And many people feel that they need to go to a forest. The word is like Aranya, and you may have heard that word, like forest monks, Aranya Wasi, monks who live in the forest. But it does not mean forest. Aranya means like wilderness, not ruled, not under a king or a queen or something. Far enough away that you can meditate there without disturbance. And if you want to understand a typical place where you can go to meditate and become fully enlightened. How many of you have been to Bodh Gaya in India on pilgrimage? Well, quite a few of you have. A member in the old days, it was called Uruwela. It was a place, it was a garden next to the river. In those days, it was very peaceful. Next to a river, you can go and bathe, get some water. And it was a park. It was very, very conducive. Hardly anybody there. A great place to meditate. And this was important, to find such places where you can develop deep meditation in peace. So you find a nice place. The second thing to do is you, they say, sit cross-legged. In the time of the Buddha, everybody would do that. But there are some people who, either through sports injuries or physical injuries, such as you know, car crashes, you can't sit for long cross-legged. What can they do? You sit on a chair. Or any way which you can sit comfortably, not disturbed by the body. And that is what that means. It says one thing, but you can interpret that because you understand the meaning of it, so you don't have to be disturbed by your body. And the next thing, what I was really focusing on, on this question, was you, they call it uh, parimukhan sati, you establish. You establish mindfulness Parimukhang. And many people translate that in English as you establish mindfulness in front of you. What the heck does that mean? In front of you, number one, you're not supposed to exist, anatta, non self. But anyway, if you do think you exist, where are you? You're not behind your nose. Is that where you live? Behind your nose? You can't be in front of here. Where else do you live? You ask maybe sort of a Westerner where they live, they mostly live up here. So you're supposed to watch the breath, you know, at the front of your head. Or if you like, believe like in the heart, is that where you live, mostly in the heart, and establish mindfulness in front of your chest? When you examine it, it doesn't mean that at all. The word parimukhan, it does mean in front, but not of you. You establish mindfulness. The word in English is a priority. You put it first, put it top of the list. That's the first thing you do when you start meditating. People miss that. Sometimes you establish 
mindfulness on the breath. When you just cross your legs, you sit down, okay, let's watch the breath. No. That's a big mistake people make. So much so that they think they can't do meditation. Because they look at the breath too soon. You're not ready to watch the breath yet. You have to establish mindfulness. Be comfortable. Calm down. So many people tell me they can't watch the breath. As soon as they start watching the breath, maybe one breath or half a breath, and then they're off thinking about business or who's winning the soccer tonight or whatever else you, you follow. And it means that you've, you've rushed too fast. Establish mindfulness first. But then we ask, what is mindfulness? And to me, the best definition of mindfulness is being in this moment, letting go of the past and the future. If you are obsessed with the past, what happened earlier today or even five minutes ago, you're not really aware of what's happening now. And if you're thinking, how long is that jump I'm going to take answering this one question, there's so many more to answer afterwards, you're not in this present moment, you're in the future. So being in this moment right now is how you can be aware. But not, that's still not enough. The other thing which I ask people to do is to be silent. I remember this, I've never been able to get a better simile than this. And this is from the great Taoist master, Lao Tzu. He would go on a walk with one disciple every evening. But there was a rule they had to keep. When they were walking with the great Taoist master like Lao Tzu, they were not allowed to speak. They had to keep silent. And they, one evening he took this new disciple on a walk with him. They went up to the mountains. When they got to a ridge in the mountains about sunset, there was this gorgeous sunset. There were oranges, purples, yellows, an incandescent sky. And this young man, on his first walk with the Master, forgot the instructions. And he blurted out, look at that beautiful sunset, that's gorgeous. Now if Lao Tzu had said you've taught, you've broken your rules, then Lao Tzu would also break his rules. He never said anything, he just turned around and walked back to the temple. You all know that story, don't you, about the four monks who had the vow of noble silence? The first monk sneezed. The second monk said, bless you. The third monk said, you've broken your vow of silence. <laughs> and the fourth monk said, so have you. And the first monk who sneezed and said, I'm glad I'm the only one here who can keep silence. <laughs> you have to keep quiet. So any, anyhow, when the Lao Tzu got back to the monastery, then he said, look, you broke your rule there. So I can't allow you ever to go on a walk with me again. That was really a tough punishment. And then his friends wanted to intercede and help this young man out. And they asked Lao Tzu, look, what's wrong? He only said, what a beautiful sunset. What's wrong with that? And that's when Lao Tzu explained, when my student said, what a beautiful sunset, he was not watching the sunset anymore. He was just watching the words. When I first heard that explanation, I thought, wow, what a beautiful explanation that is. If you see the stars at night and think, that's a beautiful stars in the sky. You're not watching the stars anymore. You're watching your explanation, the words. Real mindfulness is without words. You see, you feel, you know, and you're watching the thing, not your explanation of it. Silent, present moment awareness. That's what I, my definition of mindfulness. Easy to understand, 
And once you get into it, it's so much more beautiful. You're seeing things without giving it names, without judging it. It's far more delightful and far more close to truth as well. So that's the mindfulness. So when you start the meditation, see how much mindfulness you can generate first of all. And then what happens Thank you. That keeps the questions from blowing away. <laughs> then, then what happens is your things like the breathing, they come up automatically. You don't go looking for the breath. The breath is always there. Are you breathing right now? Why aren't you aware of it? Because I'm talking, listening to me instead. But if I shut up and you're peaceful and nothing else was happening, the breath would be so clear to you. Years ago, I was invited to go into one of these sensory deprivation chambers. You know, these little boxes. In there is water at, at a body temperature. The water is salty, so you just float in there, you don't touch the bottom, you're just like suspended in this warm uh, water. And they close the top up so you can't see, there's no light, it's soundproof, there's no sound. Because you're floating in water, your body temperature, you can't feel, all your senses are shut down. The problem is that when you go into those little boxes, you can hear your breathing so loud. <laughs> you can't shut that off yet. Which is one of the reasons why many of those sensory deprivation chambers these days is some sort of video playing. No, silent. You know, if you like to play golf, or just how to improve your swing. If there's any other problem you have, you need something to basically to entertain you. If not, you just be aware of your breathing. Because that's what happens when all the other senses disappear. That's the only one left. Which is one of the reasons why, if you do practice mindfulness, and the commentary starts to stop, then you find you can watch your breathing easily. It's the only thing left moving. So this is the general beginning of all meditation. Just letting go of past and future, actually being real right here, right now, and stopping the commentary, being still enough. It's not that hard to stop that commentary. I remember a, a business meeting they ask me, can you please tell all these high-flying business people how to be still? Yeah, easy. So I asked everybody to close their eyes. I'll ask you to do this now. Please close your eyes and listen to me. Because as I'm speaking, you'll be able to notice something strange in the way I speak, you'll be able to notice there are many spaces between my words. In those gaps between my words, what was happening in your mind? When I wasn't speaking, could you notice silence, the space between my words? You didn't have to create silence, it's always there. 
It's easy to see once you realize what you're looking at. You can open your eyes now if you wish. That's what the silent present moment awareness is like. You're here and you're giving anything names. Imagine what would happen. Then you don't have to judge anything, you don't have to assess anything, weigh anything. You do become very peaceful and it becomes easy to watch your breathing. It just goes in and out by itself. So that's actually the beginning of the meditation. Please excuse me for not answering the question directly. I took the opportunity just to teach, especially those people here, about how to begin this meditation. The second part of this question, what should we use as an anchor to the present moment? Breath, bodily sensations. You don't need to anchor anything if you're in the present moment. All you have is what's happening now. Don't think you have to anchor anything. You're here. What's happening? There is another type of meditation. I'll teach this again. You probably heard me teach it before. I call it the Emperor's Three Questions type of meditation. It's based on a story by Leo Tolstoy, which I read as a student. There was an emperor who was fed up with religions, always arguing who's the best. Even with Buddhism, which is the best meditation? Theravada meditation, Zen meditation, Vajrayana meditation, the forest teacher's meditation, this meditation, we pass in the meditation, Samatha meditation, Metta meditation. Oh my goodness, you must be so confused as lay people. You have one meditation teacher comes up today and they said, I'll do it this way. And then next week somebody else comes up here and said, no, no, don't do it that way, do it my way. And then they said, no, someone, it must be so difficult for you. It's not the way of meditation which is important. It's your attitude to meditation. Which is why these Leo Tolstoy's story of the Emperor's Three Questions, it gets to the heart of what meditation is. And the Emperor's Three Questions, I'm sure you've heard it before. When is the most important time? Two. Who is the most important person? Three, what's the most important thing to do? The when, the who, and what to do. So, the first question, when is the most important time? Is it 9.30 when we can all go to bed? <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, now is the most important time. That's the easy one. Now is where the future is being made. Now is the only time you have. Second question. I'm going to go to the third question. No, okay, go to the second question. Who is the most important person? <laughs> now it's not me. Who is the most important person in the whole world? Is it you? No way. When I read the answer to this, it was a brilliant answer. So much so, I was a student, I was about 18 at the time, and I just put the book down and just went for a walk. It blew my mind, as they said. I thought, wow, I never understood this before. It explains so much. The most important person in the whole world is the person right in front of you now, whoever that happens to be. Sir, you're the most important person in the world to me right now. <laughs> Now you are. <laughs> You're right in front of me. And honestly, I tried to practice this all my life as a monk. When somebody comes to see me, there may be a little kid. To me, I remember, they're right in front of me, they ask me a question. They must be considered to be the most important person in the world. Then you can actually uh, relate to them. You can hear their question. It's important you do that. How many of you go talking to someone, some big shot somewhere, and you realize they're not listening to you, they're just trying to get rid of you? 
That's a very nasty feeling. So please, if they're talking to you, please make sure that they know in this moment they are the most important person in the world to you. And the last question, what's the most important thing to do? And that, is, sometimes you talk with doctors, and with doctors that I say that your job is not to cure people. If you think as a doctor you have to cure people, you'll get disappointed, frustrated so many times, you'll be a failure. You can't always cure people as a doctor. One day they will die. What you can always do is care for them. In English it's just the change of one letter from the U to the A. Care for people. I remember this one doctor was about to resign because he felt a failure when one of his patients died. And I told him, look, curing people is not your purpose in life. Caring for people is. You never need to feel a failure. You can always care for people. You can't always cure them. So those become the Empress Three questions. What's that got to do with meditation? <laughs> Everything. That's all you need to do to get enlightened, if you want to. Now's the only time you have. Forget about what happened this afternoon when you were meditating. Forget what you're going to do tomorrow. Now's the only time you ever have. Now is the most important time. Who is the, what is the most important meditation object? What are you supposed to be aware of? Whatever is in front of your mind right now, whatever that is, even the most stupid, embarrassing object of meditation, if it's here right now, it's important. It's come to teach you something, to, something to learn from. So don't discriminate. You know, now, please excuse me, you may be having a sexual fantasy. I shouldn't do that. Or you may be having these images of great nimitas. Oh, that's okay, I'll take that. No, whatever's in front right now, that's the most important thing in the whole world. What do you do with it? You care for it. You never ever try and get rid of anything. You never try and keep anything. You care for it. And it will stay as long as it's needed to teach you what you need to know. Trust in that. So when is the most important time? What's the most important meditation object? Whatever's right now in front of you. And what do you do with it? Just care for it. Open the door of your heart to this moment, that's all. So simple, but so powerful. And all the other types of meditation, everything I'm going to teach is basically an expansion of that. You're watching the body first of all, relaxing it, building up mindfulness, and the body tends to vanish and you watch the mind. What am I supposed to watch the mind when the body vanishes, you're still aware, what are you aware of? When you're peaceful, when you're happy, just be with it. Don't choose, don't try and get rid of things. Be with it. Your job is to learn. You are really respectful, that's why I respect you here in Penang. I can say anything, teach anything, and you will just listen. Well done. That's what to do when you are meditating. Whatever comes up in your mind, be aware of it, be kind to it, it's important. You learn so much from it. Okay, that's the first question in half an hour. <laughs> but I added so much other information as well. I'll try to be quicker for the next question. But first of all, is that okay so far? Does anyone want to comment back? It makes meditation so easy. You just stop interfering and thinking, I shouldn't be aware of this, I should be aware of something else. You're giving importance to this moment. You're not trying hard. This moment is the most important in the whole world. That's it. 
how to stop myself from falling asleep during meditation. Don't even try to stop. If you feel sleepy, all of you who are staying here on this retreat, haven't you got beds in the dormitories? If you have, you know what a bed is there for? To sleep on. If you feel tired, really tired, then go to bed. It's amazing. If you stop fighting sleepiness, understand it. There was, I told this story in interviews, so I'm going to tell it again now. This is from the suttas. This is the stories told by the Buddha. So you can't argue with these. These are pretty, you know, from the master himself. And so he was walking with his attendant, Ananda. They saw on the forest a monk sitting in perfect meditation posture. The right leg over the left leg, right hand over the left hand, thumb slightly touching, back straight, chin tucked in, eyes closed but not shut down hard, perfectly still. And the Buddha turned around to Ananda and said, I'm worried about that monk. Sure enough, a couple of weeks later, that monk disrobed. And then, deeper in the forest, he saw another monk. And this monk, his posture was not that perfect, and he was nodding, really falling asleep. Actually, he probably was already asleep. <laughs> and the Buddha turned to Ananda and smiled. And the, Ananda, why are you smiling? Not worried about him. A couple of weeks later, that monk was perfectly enlightened with psychic powers. So if you're sleepy during this meditation retreat, just please carry on for another week after we finish. <laughs> we may have another enlightened person here in Penang. <laughs> now that kind of shocked me when I first saw it, until later on when you practiced a lot, and you know, talk with so many other monks and nuns. Oh, please come in. No problem, please come in the back. Talk with so many others, and you realize what was happening. The first monk, sitting perfectly straight, was a control freak. He was always you know, ordering his body to sit straight, not to move, not to be sleepy. That is never a path to stillness. The control freak eventually just can't go any further. Look, that is an important teaching. You can sit here all night. If you're a control freak, you get nowhere. You just get really stuffed up in your head. But you find a person who just, it's time to sleep, and they sleep, and they sleep well. They don't control anything. They learn how to be kind. To their body and mind. Isn't Buddhism supposed to be kind? And sometimes I wonder, are you Buddhists? Because sometimes you don't treat your body kind at all. You know, one person already asked me, they said because of some uh, sickness, they needed to drink some milk in the evening or something, a little something. It's breaking my eight precepts, am I allowed to do that? Yes! I'd rather you be healthy and be kind to yourself than you be some strict person. You keep your eight precepts without breaking them at all. But you get so sick and die and be miserable. <laughs> That's not how meditation works. Kindness. Peace, understanding your body, being a friend to your body, being a friend to your mind. And then you find, yes, you get sleepy, but then the sleepiness eventually vanishes. If you fight sleepiness, you get more tired. You're kind to it, and it vanishes. 
After a while, this is, what was it, seven, eight, nine day retreat? Seven days. Just get yourself into it. Please, all those people on this retreat, please don't get enlightened the first couple of days. <laughs> Otherwise, what will you do for the rest of the days? <laughs> you get bored. <laughs> so take it easy. And then you'll find the meditation starts to take off. You get into these blissful states of mind. You thought, wow, it actually works. Anyway, so don't stop yourself from falling asleep during meditation. Let yourself fall asleep. Let your energy restore itself. And then let the cl clarity of mind appear by itself. So many years I thought I shouldn't have a wandering mind, I shouldn't fall asleep. Tried all sorts of things to keep awake. None of, it, none of it worked, except I was only sleeping four and a half hours a day, maximum. And no wonder I was tired. I was eating very, very rotten food. Sticky rice and frog. I was a vegetarian before I became a monk. I didn't have enough nutrients in me. I was born in London and I was meditating in the jungles of Thailand, so much more hot. I wasn't used to that climate. And sometimes I didn't want to be disrespectful, but I wondered if the Buddha had been born in London. <laughs> I don't think he would have survived that well in the, in the hot climate of India. So it was just cause and effect, that's all. So when I stopped fighting Stoth and Torpa, then it vanished. And for many of you, this is pertinent to some of the things I've said during the interviews. I let myself be sleepy. You know, my head started almost hitting the floor. And I decided I'm not going to fight this. I'm just going to be with it. And then my body straightened up all by itself. I didn't do a thing. I didn't decide to straighten my body. My body did it. Your body is an autonomous thing. And when you go to sleep at night, you move. You don't tell your body to move. It does it by itself. And so when the energy came back, my body was able to sit straight with no effort at all. The wandering mind, thinking about this and thinking about that, I was told when I first became a meditator, if your mind wanders, bring it back again. It wanders again, bring it back once more. For about eight years I did that. It did not work. I thought, when is it going to stay still? It always goes over there, bring it back, okay. Goes over there, bring it back. Goes somewhere else, bring it back. No, because I was a long-time meditator. After eight years, it didn't work. So what do you do next? You practice kindness. My body wants to wander off. Off you go. Have a nice time. I let my mind wander off. And it came back straight away. Weird. But that's how it worked. And I asked myself, why does my mind want to wander off? I want to watch the breath, what's wrong with that? It would be great for my mind to watch the breath. You know, you might get some nice peace and beautiful lights in the mind, jhanas, enlightenment. Why not? And so instead of forcing my mind to watch the breath, if you want to, fine. If you don't want to, fine. It's like my mind was really surprised. I was being kind to it. I was respecting my mind instead of trying to dominate my mind and tell it what to do. In your home, have you got a partner, a husband or a wife who keeps telling you what to do? <laughs> I heard a few giggles. <laughs> They always say in Asian culture, 
the husband has to be in front, the wife has to be behind. And they say it's like an elephant. When you marry, it's like, before when you're single, you've got two legs, you can go whichever way you want. Your partner has two legs, they can go wherever they want. But when you're married, you're like an elephant, one body with four legs. And I always say this, especially in Sri Lanka, the man has to be the front legs of the elephant. It's the culture. And I've got no right to blame that culture. And the woman has to be the back legs. But don't worry, guys, because in Sri Lanka, I think in Penang too, the elephant always walks backwards. <laughs> You get the message there. <laughs> but if your does, mind does wander off, let it. Be kind to it. Mind if you want to wander off, that's fine by me. Then the mind doesn't wander off at all. It's found someone who cares for it, understands it, will never go anywhere. If you have a beautiful relationship with your partner, you understand them. Then you have this happy relationship. You can let them go to, say, a football match, and then she goes shopping, whatever they do, and then you don't argue with them. So that's what my husband's like. He likes to go shopping. <laughs> my wife wants to see the football match. <laughs> I know couples like that. They're weird, but that's what they like. But anyway, when you understand one another and really love them, you give them that type of freedom, and they will never actually leave you. And that's like you know, my mind and my say my meditation. After all these years, I've got a really good relationship with the mind. My mind and I, if I'm not talking, if I have. Some, uh, st some peace in the afternoon or evening. My mind and I, we chill out together. You know what chilling out means? We meditate. We love each other's company, because I never tell my mind what to do. We just hang out together. We don't need to worry about a wandering mind, because we like each other. My mind doesn't wander anywhere. Please try that. It took me too many years to figure out myself. But it works. I don't want you to waste too much time. Okay. Okay, that's basically answering the second question too. I feel distracted by the inhal inhalation, exhalation of breath. I could feel the movement of my chest from inhaling and exhaling. Don't worry about that. Just make sure your mindfulness is in the present moment, you're silent, and you just notice the breath, and it stays with you, it doesn't go anywhere, and after a while it becomes so peaceful. And basically nothing can distract you. Third question, that was actually a quick answer, it's only 15 minutes. <laughs> what is life after death? Can we stop reincarnation? Can we stop sorrow? You can stop sorrow, that's the first thing, very easy to do. Why be sorrowful about something which you cannot stop? Say, for example, someone close to you in this life dies. Say it's your family member. Say it's your father. My father died when I was 16, at home, woken up in the middle of the night by my mother. I can't wake up your dad. So I went into his bedroom and shook him. He was cold. He had died. Did I feel sorrowful? I love my dad. He's one of my mentors in early life. I never felt sad at all. Even though you'd lost your dad. No, I never actually said that. I didn't lose my dad. I gained my dad for 16 years. I never looked at what was taken away. I looked at what I enjoyed. 16 years of a very loving father. And at his funeral service, I never cried. 
I've never felt sad that my father died. The feeling I had, and I've shared this with many people over many years, was the same feeling I had when I went to a Rolling Stones concert when I was only 11, when I later saw the first concert of the rock band Led Zeppelin. I was at the very first concert. When I went to some uh, concert by this band who weren't famous at all, only six of us turned up to listen to it. The lead singer was a person called Rod Stewart. But I knew it was great music. When it finished, I wasn't a monk, I was a lay person, of course. When it finished, I never cried, the concert was over. I went out thinking, wow, how lucky I was to have been there at some of these beautiful performances. And that's exactly the emotion I felt when my father died. Not sadness, but a sense of, wow, how lucky I had been to be with a father like that. Not sadness, but appreciation. That's how to get rid of sorrow. The person who's passed away, would you rather never have known them? With reincarnation, life after death, of course it happens. For you, have you learnt enough to stop reincarnation? Or do you still want more? It's amazing, it's nice to think, no, I don't want to be reincarnated anymore. When it actually happens, yes you do. You don't know how to be still enough. So when the bus comes to take you to your next life, this is only a metaphor. When the bus comes, the bus can't find you. So it goes off. It's a simple uh, metaphor, but anyway, I better go on to the next question. Stopping rebirth means becoming fully enlightened. Can you do that? Why not? Dear Ajahn, when I started to learn meditation, a friend told me that a Buddhist friend of hers got possessed during meditation. I've seen cases of possession, so I can't ridicule it anymore. Real possession by spirits, especially at this time of the year. People who aren't Buddhists, who don't keep their precepts, get possessed by what I call the, the bottle ghosts. <laughs> they live in bottles. And you open the, the, open the top of the bottle, and you drink some of whatever's inside of it, and you get possessed. You speak in very strange way, and you can't even walk in a straight line. And if you drive a car, you're liable to hit the car and even kill yourself. The bottle ghost is called whiskey, rum, gin, alcohol. It lives in bottles and that's why it's called spirits. <laughs> And that's real possession. I'm sure you've seen people possessed by the bottle ghost. So that's something which you can see. Being possessed by spirits as a meditator, honestly, I've never seen that. You've seen spirits, real cases of possession, but it's not because a person uh, takes alcohol. So not because it, the, not because a person meditates. The, the basic way of pre preventing yourself being uh, possessed by spirits is by keeping precepts. If you keep your five precepts and are a pure-hearted person, you always speak kind words, you always do generous deeds. If you're a good person, the spirits can't get close to you. And a story which uh, to explain that, there was one lady over in Thailand who would come to our monastery every um, moon day, the four moon days of the month. Excuse me. When she came to our monastery, she said that one day that she was washing her face in the mirror when what she saw in the mirror wasn't her face, 
It was a demon's face. This is a true story. A monster's face. And she was basically for a moment terrified. It's like a monster in the mirror. And then she came to the monastery to ask her what's going on. What had happened is that a boy in town had fallen in love with her. She refused him. So he got this, basically the spirit doctor to, who, who owned a spirit, basically, and to hire the spirit to kill her. And so they got the monks in to do some chanting in this house. And then one of the other people got possessed temporarily and so the spirit started talking. And that's where they found out the story. And the spirit said, I've been trying to kill this girl for about two or three years. This is the closest he'd ever got by actually being able to see her. And she to see him in a mirror. But she said, I can't get that close to her. And the reason was the head monk at the time, that was Ajahn Jan, a close the senior disciple of Ajahn Chah, said, you can't get close to her because she's such a good woman, keeping her precepts, never doing any sort of bad or faulty or selfish things. said, you will never get close to her. But then the spirit said, but if I don't get close to her, if I don't kill her, then I will have to die. And the monk said, it's better you die <laughs> than you kill somebody else. And the spirit agreed. The monk gave the spirit five precepts. And the spirit disappeared and never came back. <coughs> That's what happens. I've seen so many cases of that. You keep things like just five precepts, be a good person. The spirits, they just can't, can't get you, they can't harm you. Meditation is certainly not dangerous at all. So whoever said a friend of a friend told me the Buddhist friend of hers got possessed during meditation, that's, I don't know what meditation she was doing, but if she's keeping her precepts, that's impossible. Is it possible for one to get possessed by spirits during meditation? Keep precepts? No. If so, what could have gone wrong during meditation? It wasn't backed up by sila, by, by, by precepts. And what should one do if that should happen? Is just that the possession will disappear. And then when it does, make sure next time you keep precepts. You do good things. But please don't be afraid. There's so many more dangers from not meditating than any dangers from meditating. Too many people try and turn you off meditating. Because when you really become a good meditator, you become a very good Buddhist. And no one will ever be able to turn you away from being a Buddhist. Even on your deathbed. I tell a lot of people this. I remember telling the old chief reverend uh, in Brickfield's temple. Because at that time there was many people going to the deathbeds of maybe your grandfather or your uncle because their grandson was like a, one of the born-again Christians. And so he went to their bedside and tried to convert them to being a, a Christian. They had good intentions, only it was stupid what they were trying to do. And so they asked my advice. and said, oh, it's easy what the advice is. If you know that you are, if that's you, on your deathbed, and one of your relations tries to convert you to being a Christian, please convert to be a Christian. And then they will leave. And once they're out of the door, then you can convert back again to be a Christian. <laughs> Otherwise, they will never leave you. You can convert one way, you can convert the other. I remember the Chief Reverend, Dr. K. Sri Dhammananda, really liked that answer, and spread it around. Anyway, so please put that concern to rest. Just be a good person, keep your precepts, and you don't have to worry. You will not be possessed. Guaranteed, money back guarantee. <laughs> okay. Next question. The lower a person's ego, the happier. 
How to lower a person's ego. Thank you, Ajahn Brahm, for guidance. You know, I've got so much responsibility these days. You know, when I, I come here and I help teach, you know, it started off as a Mahindarama Pali school, giving talks, teaching retreats over here in Penang, also up in KL, in the KL, the Buddhist Gem Fellowship, I'm one of their spiritual advisors. And over in Singapore, I am the spiritual I don't know, advisor of the Buddhist Fellowship and also the Brahm Center and also Bodhinyana Singapore. And over in, even in Sri Lanka, they have the Brahm Society. And so I'm obviously the spiritual, I don't know what of that. And over in Perth and other places in Australia and the nuns monastery, which you know, we just bought some new land for them over in Oxford. I'm, I'm not their spiritual advisor. I'm not their spiritual director. Actually, I'm a spiritual advisor. But I'm also, <laughs> they work on a trust. Like, I think there's six or seven people on the trust. And I'm the chairman of the board of trustees, <laughs> for goodness sake. And also uh, of the Australian Sangha Association. I've got so many things I'm supposed to do. So how do you cope? I remember just after talking all weekend at our city centre in Perth. I went to monastery on Sunday evening, tired, had a good sleep, and in the morning I was with a visitor and they said, oh, you're so lucky to live in a peaceful, beautiful monastery like Bodhinyana Monastery in Serpentine. My Lord said, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is my workplace. <laughs> this is my job. I'm the abbot here, the head monk. This is not peaceful. And then I realized I was mistaken. So I made a vow from that day on, on a Monday morning, if I was in Bodhinyana Monastery, I would not be the head monk. I would not be the abbot. And if somebody came along and said, I want to speak with Ajahn Brahm, I said, I don't think he's here today. <laughs> If something was wrong, if the plumbing was leaking, sorry, I'm not the boss today. <laughs> if a monk was going crazy, sorry, I'm not the teacher. If somebody had a meditation question, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not me today. I took one morning off every week. Just one morning. That's not much to ask. You know, most people only work five days a week, maybe six days a week. I was working six and a half days a week. <laughs> so when I had a morning off, the result was spectacular. I could see what you saw if you went to Bodhinyana Monastery, where I live. It was a peaceful place when you're not the boss. <laughs> you could appreciate the beauty when you weren't responsible for it. This place here, it's a nice, nice hall here. It's clean, reasonably easy to get to, it's comfortable. But if you own this place and had to clean it every day, <laughs> no, because this is another burden. That's how you lessen your ego. You don't own things. Your body, how healthy is it? If you think it's your body, you have to worry about it every day. How about on once a week, one day a week, you, or one morning a week, recognize you don't own your body, you're just kind of renting it for 80 years or 90 years, however. It's not really yours. So you can have one day a week or one morning a week when you don't own it, then you can enjoy it. Just like when you have a higher car, or you own the car. There's a big difference. 
If you're renting a room in a hotel or you own the house, there's a big difference there in worries and concerns. So imagine you feel, I don't own my body, I just have it for a short while. It's much easier to deal with, it's more peaceful. And for you meditators, imagine you really understand you don't own your mind. It's not your mind. It doesn't belong to you. It's part of nature. If you can see that, you don't worry about it. It's far more peaceful. As the Buddha said in his second sermon, Anattalakana Sutta, you can't say, my consciousness may be like this or be like that. You can't do that. Why? Because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to this great line of cause and effect, it belongs to nature. Your will, your perceptions, even your perceptions. Your perceptions will be different than mine. You watch TV, many of you. You know, you're Penangi. I spend most of my time in Australia. Even our perceptions will be different. I'm a monk. Most of you are lay people. It's not my mind. It's caused by nature. So when we understand that, we understand that at least we can be true one morning a week. I don't own my mind. So you can sit down and meditate. It's not my mind. What am I worried about? So you don't try and control it. Like I don't control my monastery at least one morning a week. Whatever goes wrong there, it's not my monastery. Just like when I go into Mahindarama temple. It's not my monastery. You never find me picking up a broom and sweeping the leaves. <laughs> So maybe you can get the, the message there. To let go of ego is to let go of... Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about letting go of ego, you know, that I give lots and lots of talks, and some of those talks, you know, are just... Uh, they go such a long way. I think the biggest talk is about four million individual downloads. If I was a rock star, I would get a Grammy or something, an award. And even there were, I think I mentioned this yesterday, I got an email from this man in Prague, Czechoslovakia, who's translating many of these talks into Ukrainian and Russian and setting them out, and they're really, really popular, over 200,000 of them. And I thought, wow. What a beautiful thing, you can do something for the suffering in both sides of conflict. So, these are very popular talks. For the first time I gave a live talk, which so many people were listening to, was over in Singapore. And there was about five or six thousand people coming one evening to listen to me. Just me, no one else. And I thought, Ajahn Brahm, this is really, really, really dangerous. You can get so proud, so egotistic. Or, if it doesn't turn out well and people don't like the talk, then I'll be letting down Buddhism. I thought, this is not right. Maybe I should just turn around and go home. And they'd spent so much money organizing this in a big... <coughs> Convention Center, Suntech City Convention Center Hall over in Singapore. But I solved the problem by realizing I never give a talk. Everything which I teach is because of all the teachers who taught me. So this is Ajahn Chah giving the talk this evening. And that took all the pressure off me. I'm talking because of how I've been trained. It's not Ajahn Brahm, even this evening. This is not Ajahn Brahm giving the talk. It's all the teachers who have taught me. 
That's where this comes from. And that was so useful because that got me out of this terrible ego trap. When I realized cause and effect, it's not a human being giving a talk, it's all the teachers who taught me. I also let that happen too. Very often when I give a talk, a big talk, I don't know what I'm going to say, but I trust that I've had such a good training, something good will come out. It usually does. And I look back upon it afterwards and say, where on earth did that teaching come from? And I remember, it was, Ajahn Chah told me that, years ago. I can remember it. That's how you let go of ego. Okay, next question. During daily chanting, the name of with eye, name of Buddha with eyes closed, the name of Buddha. Oh, during daily chanting, the name of Buddha with eyes closed or meditating. Many times, I could see either white or colorful lights floating in front of me. Suddenly, is that an imagination or what is it? When it appears, then I would come back to reality, and it's gone. If it's real, what should I do next? Thank you for your guidance. That is very likely to be what we call the nimitta stage of meditation. What this really is, is that when you're, say, watching the breathing, many of the senses, the five senses, turn off or become very weak. And so then you have the possibility of being aware of the sixth sense, the mind. I know that when I was in Singapore, I mentioned that at a conference, talking with one of my best friends, this was a guy who was the first Buddhist I ever met at Cambridge. You can check him out on the internet if you like, Professor Bernard Carr, C-A-R-R, Emeritus Professor of Queen Mary College in, uh, in London University, a theoretical physicist. He was one of the close um, advisors of Professor Hawkins. So much so that Professor Hawkins attended his wedding when he married Mary. Mary was there at, uh, at uh, Singapore as well. He's a Buddhist theoretical physicist, very famous one. Uh, even there was, I think, a movie, The Theory of Everything, about Stephen Hawking's life. And Bernard was in it. He was act, someone else played the part of Bernard in the movie. He was that close to Stephen Hawkins. And we did lots of experiments together. And when you have, I forget how I got into this. <laughs> but anyway, when you actually start meditating, you get very still. Oh, that's right, about the nature of the mind. Still so many scientists, including Professor Hawkins, keep on state, or he used to state when he was alive, he knows better now, now he's dead. <laughs> Always thinking that the mind is some byproduct of the brain. And Bernard sort of knows it's not. The mind is independent of the brain. It can use the brain, when a person passes away, there's so much evidence. The mind is independent of the brain. When you die, you will know that. Your brain stops working. The mind or the stream of consciousness carries on. How do you know that for sure? You don't have to die yet. <coughs> when you start to see those colorful lights in the mind, the more your five senses have settled down and disappeared, the more those lights will appear. And the more they will stay. And the more beautiful they will be. These lights, these nimitas, can be so, so joyful. And one of the, the characteristics Say if you see, say, a yellow light, 
that yellow will be more beautiful than any yellow you can see in the real world. More yellow than yellow. More blue than blue. More white than any white you've ever seen. Because your senses have been like clarified. That's typical of these nimittas. They are a mental object. You're not seeing these with your sense of sight. You're experiencing these things through your mind. That's how the mind works. And all the time when people see some colorful lights floating in front of you suddenly, so many people kept on saying they were imagination. But when all the time people have reported these things to me, 99% of the time they are real. You're beginning to see how your mind perceives this thing we call the mind. Obviously they come suddenly and they, they go very quickly because you're not still enough yet. There come the time when you are still and these lights will come up and afterwards you'd realize your eyes are fully closed and you're not hearing anything. You can't feel your body. The breath has gone a long time ago. We see these beautiful lights in the mind called nimittas. If you want to see where the Buddha taught about these, they're in the Upakalesa Sutta, in the Majjhima Nikaya, where the Buddha describes all the hindrances to these lights coming up and staying with you. You're actually getting in contact with your mind. And weird things happen, safe things. One of the things which happen, Sometimes you have these beautiful lights that get so incredibly bright, it's like looking at the sun. But when those things first happen, be careful, you think, if I keep watching this nimitta, it's so incredibly bright and powerful, I'll go blind. You don't go blind. You're not watching this with your eyes, it's how the mind sees or how your mindfulness sees the mind at this point in your meditation. It can be as bright as you possibly want. Number two, they're so joyful. I don't know what your happiest experience has been so far in this life, but this will surpass those. And sometimes you see these beautiful nimbutas and you feel that a human being can't take so much happiness. It kind of explode. It's not just momentary, this lasts for a long time. For minutes, hours. Can you take so much happiness? One of the insights I got, yes, you can. Why is it happy? Because your body has vanished and you're still. It's the bliss of meditation. And I keep saying that to encourage you. It's not dangerous. You, when you get to this state of meditation, you are, as I mentioned yesterday, you're invulnerable. Nothing can harm you. You've got power. Real big power. So anyway, they are real. You're understanding the nature of the mind. These aren't physical anymore. This is mind. And you know it exists. You understand how it works and how beautiful it can be. You will understand also what happens when you pass away. The body dies. The stream of consciousness, you know exactly what it is, will carry on for another life. Or eventually when you learn enough, you don't have to get reborn again. Is that okay for you? I didn't scare you? There are three questions left. How do we stop worries, issues that come all at once? Teenager, kids, not study well, work pressure, financial challenge, family matters. That's easy. These problems which come all at once, you think this is the end of the world for you. But you're just elaborating so much. Trust your kids, your teenagers. Yeah, they get into mischief. 
Was I a good child when I was growing up? I'll tell you one of the very naughty things I did when I was about six years of age. I don't know why my mother did worry about me. It was my mother's birthday. So I decided to go and get her a present. I think I was maybe six, maybe seven years of age. In London at that time, they had like a, a food craze of uh, mashed potatoes and jellied eels. So I decided to get my mother a present. I had a nice box and wrapping paper, and I went to the shop to buy an eel, a live one. And I put it in a box. And I wrapped up the box the same day, because I knew the eel couldn't survive long in the box. And I wrapped up the box with this beautiful happy birthday paper, lots of flowers on it. And I tied it up in a ribbon as best a six-year-old boy could do. And I had this nice little card on it. To mummy, with love from your son, Peter. That was my name. Happy birthday. My I must have been a great actor, because my mum never suspected anything. <laughs> <laughs> my poor mother. And on her birthday, I presented it to her. Surprise gift. For those of you who have children, imagine what you would feel like. Ah, oh, so sweet. My little six-year-old was thinking about me. And that, it wasn't you know, perfectly wrapped up, but I did it myself, and that meant so much to my mother. And I gave it to her. Happy birthday, mummy. Ah, oh, she was almost crying. And she opened it slowly. <laughs> <laughs> And when she opened it, took all the wrapping paper off, I tied the ribbon and opened the box. I could not have trained this eel better. As soon as she opened the box, it lifted up its head and looked at my mum. <laughs> she screamed! <laughs> so loud! Everybody in London must have heard it. When I was a smart kid, I had what these days they call the, you know, the, escape, the escape strategy. I ran like nothing. I was going to say ran like hell, I shouldn't say that. I did. I ran as fast as I could. I had my hiding place and I lay low for two or three hours. <laughs> it worked. What a nasty young boy I was. But my mother just forgave me. I kind of respected my mother for that, but you worry. Some of the issues that come all at once. Most of the time you find out you worry and what you worry about doesn't happen. And my whole life that's been the case. So many things, bad things could have happened and never did. I really thought the world would end with a nuclear explosion, I think in the 70s. Never did. So work pressure, financial challenge, you just keep on going. Do the best you can. Work pressure, if you have work pressure, everybody else in your office has the same work pressure. Just keep on going, don't worry. Worry doesn't help the pressure, it makes it worse. Financial challenge, financial challenge is not that hard. You just only buy half a durian instead of a whole one. <laughs> you can still taste it. And it's a monk. As a monk, I'd learn how to live on so little and have so few possessions. What that taught me is just how easy it is to survive and live. You don't need to have the best. You can walk or get a bicycle to travel around Penang. So anyhow, however you do things, you find out you can cope. Have trust in yourself. If not, if you really are in financial pressure and you can't afford things, you can always become a Buddhist nun. <laughs> <laughs> then you have no financial worries at all. You get well fed, 
<laughs> you always have a place to stay. You've got nothing to worry about. <laughs> Next question. I always go into drowsiness, sleepiness whenever meditation starts. How to improve this? Don't. Learn from it. If you have sleepiness, drowsiness when meditation starts, it's usually because you've been working too hard and too stressed out. Have some rest. Now honestly, those of you who have been to my meditation retreat center in uh, opposite our monastery, Jhana Grove Meditation Retreat Center, I built that myself. I built it because I wanted to make sure that people have a good place where they can practice what I teach. Everyone has their own room, 60 rooms for meditators. Every room has its own ensuite. You don't have to queue up to go to the toilet. We got good food there. And also, pretty good teacher when he's there. <laughs> <laughs> but not on Monday mornings. <laughs> you do that because I often say to people, the first few days you're there, please sleep. You've got beautiful beds by yourself. There's no one to wake you up, no one to criticize you, to go to the toilet, you just go in your ensuite and have a nice shower, hot showers or cold showers, whatever you like, to give you that sense of freedom, to be kind to your body and to your mind. And I say sometimes people spend the first couple of days sleeping. Why? Because sometimes they have to travel such a long way to get there. I say all the way from Penang to get there. That's a long trip. You will be tired when you get there. And sometimes working hard to get everything sorted out before you can arrive. I know there's one person who's going to be teaching a retreat there. When is it? In, is it February, April, March? Yes! We've invited Venerable Kai C to teach a meditation retreat at Jhana Grove. Sorry? Waysak time. Wow! Do you want to stay in Penang during Waysak? Why didn't you go off to Jhana Grove and have a nice retreat there? And so you can just sleep as much as you like. <laughs> <laughs> the Venerable Kai C is a very nice soft monk. So, you know, he will allow you to do things like that if you need to. Nice beds, quietness, and have a beautiful time there, looking after your body and your mind. So that's actually why we have these retreat centers. Not just to get enlightened, but to look after your body, to heal it. No stress at all. Just let in the laying down, get up whenever you want. There's always food there, sometime in the day and night. Isn't that nice for you? The last question. <laughs> See what this one is. Dear Ajahn, our beloved teacher, thank you for coming back to teach us again. I'd like to ask, how do we refrain bad thoughts from arising, continue to purify it to become like you? I feel evil whenever bad thoughts arise. Oh my goodness. <laughs> if a bad thought or a series of bad thoughts or bad dreams arise, have some notepaper next to your bed. And when you have these bad dreams, write it all down send it to DreamWorks in Hollywood. <laughs> and if that gets accepted by Mr. Spielberg, you'll never have to work again. <laughs> anyway, bad thoughts come up from the mind. They are thoughts, don't call them bad, they're just weird, that's all. And sometimes it's just like cleansing stuff. When you wash your clothes, does dirt come off? 
even in my robes, dirt comes off when I wash them. Does that mean I'm an evil monk? <laughs> no, sometimes, sometimes I spill things on my robes. That's of course why I eventually get some dirt coming off. So don't judge so harshly. So you have some bad thoughts. How many good thoughts do you have? This is one of the ways of overcoming that problem. Very simple psychology. I did this with one of the prisoners, convicts, over in Australia. They thought they were a terrible person. How can they actually leave the prison and get a proper life? They were an evil person. They were in jail for something. So I gave them a piece of paper. Write your name on the top. They did that. They trusted me. A line down the middle, on the left-hand side, all the rotten, terrible, evil things you've done in the last week. And they wrote them all down. It took them about two minutes to fill up that left side, all the bad things they've done. Now, the good things you've done over the last week. They said, nothing. I'm an evil person. I'm a bad person. I've got nothing to write down. I said, now come on. You must have done something good. I hear you like the, the cat in the prison. Oh yeah, I gave a glass of milk, this, a saucer of milk this morning. Put that down. Gave cat saucer of milk. That's a good thing. Now, okay, what other thing have you done? Once they broke that blockage, they wrote something else they'd done good. I, I woke someone up so they could get there in time for breakfast. Hey, put that down, it's a kind thing to do. And they soon filled out the right hand side. It was the very first good thing they could remember, that was the hardest to get. Once they could see they weren't such a bad person, they can put all the other good things there. So those persons who said they just had bad thoughts, write those bad thoughts on a piece of paper, and on the other side, write down the good thoughts you've had today then you can give me that piece of paper. What I will do, and I'll tear it down the middle, all the bad thoughts you've had, I won't even look at them, I'll throw it in the rubbish bin, and I'll give you back the list of good thoughts you've had. I will ask you to take it to a photocopier, and photocopy maybe 30 copies of that, and then take it to laminate them and leave it around your house, in your bag, in the toilet, in your office, wherever you go, to remind yourself, yes, you do have some bad thoughts, you also have some wonderful thoughts as well. I call that, you have a garden, and there are weeds in the garden. What are you going to do? Water the flowers or water the weeds? If you keep thinking of the bad thoughts, you're watering the weeds. If you remember the good thoughts or good qualities you have, then you can water them instead. And the flowers grow and choke off all the weeds. That's how to deal with this idea you've got lots of bad thoughts. Think of the good thoughts as well. Water them, give them an attention. That also works with other people as well. One of the, you know one of the lovely things about being a monk, you don't get paid for this job. I know I get exploited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to do that. But the job satisfaction comes when you change people's lives for the better. You say something and it works for them. And there was this lady, many years ago, who came to our temple in Perth for one reason. She was Western, Australian. She only came because when she came to the temple, it was two or three hours when she wasn't being hit by her husband. She was suffering quite intense domestic abuse. And this was at a time when the government hadn't really 
uh, initiated like laws or places where you could go when you were being hit all the time. So she came to our temple, just as an escape for a couple of hours. And what she heard was that forgiveness is not enough. What she heard is you don't just forgive faults, but you recognize and you encourage the good qualities in your husband. It's not just forgiveness, it's more than that. So she took that on board, she was like a hero. Every time her husband hit her, she tried to escape, but she never reminded him of it. Every time her husband behaved like a human being with kindness, she would hug and kiss him, give him some feedback that this is what she really appreciated. You may think that this was simplistic, and it kind of is simplistic. It took her about seven years. But I remember she came to see me after seven years, and she said, I just wanted to thank you. Because she showed me one of these meditation stools, like the Zen stools, made out of wood. My husband gave this to me today as a surprise present. I burst out crying, she said. In the past, anything wooden he would use to hit me. Now he gave this to me, an expression of love. He's a totally changed man. Every time he just started to get violent, I forgave him. But every time he did something beautiful and good, I reinforced that by telling him <coughs> how much it was appreciated. Give him a nice hug. Thank you, dear husband. And he's totally changed. And she wasn't exaggerating. He brought, she brought her husband to the monastery of Serpentine, and I saw him talk to him. He was, for some reason, he thought that's how a man should behave. His wife taught him, no, that's not how you behave. She was an incredibly strong woman. And I you know, felt, if I saw her today, giving her three bows, well done. A heroine. Of course, these days, you know, there's other ways of dealing with problems like that. What she did was very dangerous. But nevertheless, not only did she survive with her family, but she changed him, saved his life by encouraging his good qualities. So if you've got a husband or a wife who's misbehaving, she doesn't always misbehave. He doesn't always be violent. See if you can let him see his good qualities and how much you appreciate his good qualities. And that can change him. You can change another person's character. And it's beautiful when you see that. So anyway, that's the last question. Has anybody got any comments from the floor? For the second time, any other questions you would like to ask? <laughs> it's now 9.30, going, going, gone. <laughs> and thanks for seeing me. Very good. Very good.
寂静来，呼出去。我是井水，翻找着什么是真，什么是实，在我这个心里深处。Well, that's all for today. If you have any concern or questions, please feel free to contact us at info at buddhadharmatv.com. Thank you for watching the program, and I'm confident that many will gain from the programs on Buddha Dharma TV. Good night. Namo Buddhaya.